Good evening. On behalf of the University of Wisconsin School of Education, my colleagues at the Cooperative Children's Book Center, and the friends of the CCBC, and the Wisconsin Book Festival, I'd like to welcome you to the 16th annual Charlotte Zolotow Lecture. It seems like it wasn't that long ago that Charlotte herself was here in Madison for the first annual Charlotte Zolotow Lecture. And we've had an incredible group of Zolotow lecturers since then. Tonight's speaker, Leonard Marcus, is sure to be a worthy addition to our distinguished speakers. As a historian and children's literature expert, we could think of no better speaker to honor both Charlotte Zolotow and her career as an editor and author, and to honor the CCBC's 50th anniversary year. And there's no one more passionate about children's books than my friend, colleague, and mentor, Ginny Moore Cruz, Director Emerita of the CCBC, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Ginny? Good evening. And thank you, Katie. Well, as you just heard, Leonard Marcus is a highly knowledgeable children's book historian, author, and critic. And I just encourage you to take a look at his website sometime. You will be bowled over, as I was, to read all he's done and all he's doing. For example, he plans and conducts well-prepared interviews, many of which later become unique books for young readers. See books, for, uh, as examples, see books such as Funny Business, Conversations with Writers of Fantasy, or see the book Pass It Down, Five Picture Book Families Make Their Mark. And take a look at Ways of Telling, Conversations on the Art of the Picture Book. Leonard Marcus gets interviewed, too. He and his books have been featured on many media, on TV, and on public radio, such as NPR's All Things Considered and Talk of the Nation, and on the Canadian broadcasting companies, As It Happens, one of my favorite public radio programs. Leonard's books are superbly documented. Consider the book Listening for Madeline, a portrait of Madeline Lengel in many voices. This is a series of interviews with individuals who knew Madeline Lengel. And especially think of Leonard Marcus's newest book, Randolph Caldecott, The Man Who Could Not Stop Drawing. It's a handsome book, and it's compelling to read and see. It's a superior example of the organization of written and visual information. Leonard Marcus has also edited archival letters. He offered us a glimpse of the incomparable former Harper editor, Ursula Nordstrom, in his book, Dear Genius, The Letters of Ursula Nordstrom. You'll find his name on other unique publications, too, books such as the annotated Phantom Tollbooth. He's created exhibit uh, exhibition catalogs, such as the one for the Society of Illustrators titled Maurice Sendak, a celebration of the artist and his work. He's developed a book about book history dear to us in Wisconsin and elsewhere too. It's called Golden Legacy, how golden books won children's hearts, changed publishing forever, and became an American icon along the way. Leonard Marcus has served as a National Book Award judge, a three-time judge of the New York Times Best Illustrated Books of the Year, and he's a standing member of the Ezra Jack Keats New Writer and New Illustrator jury. He's been a guest speaker across North America, as well as in Singapore and Tokyo. He's a founding trustee 
of the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art, where he's currently curating a one-man retrospective of the art of the late Bernard Weber. Most recently, Leonard Marcus curated a major exhi exhibition for the New York Public Library. It's called the ABC of it, Why Children's Books Matter. It's worth a trip to Manhattan to see this extraordinary exhibition, and I'm thinking about doing it. <laughs> Leonard Marcus was born and raised in Mount Vernon, New York, where he attended public schools. Yay. <laughs> he holds degrees in history from Yale and in poetry from the University of Iowa Graduate Writers Workshop. In order to accomplish all he undertakes, he must be exceptionally well organized, and he is. I found this out firsthand several years ago. Uh, in his role as a book critic for Parenting Magazine, something he did for 20 or 21 years, he invited me and two other nationally involved children's literature specialists to suggest 20 of the best children's books to be considered for his annual Parents Magazine Best of the Year list. Very organized. He gave us a firm deadline. It was in July. Hmm. So that's where how many of the media best of the year lists, uh, how and when, are organized. Well, that explains a lot about some of them, but not about the one that Leonard managed, because it was an exceptional list. And that's when I learned he's not only superbly organized, he keeps track. Keeps track? Well... Actually, he asked me to be part of that project during one or two other years as well because he keeps track of what's going on in book publishing, with book creators, and also with what's happening in specific communities of book lovers. He had kept track of the CCBC with which I was associated the CC being the Cooperative Children's Book Center, your host for this event within the Wisconsin Book Festival. It's a children's literature research library and examination center at UW-Madison. The CCBC's longstanding commitment to diversity, along with the CCBC's respect for small and independent publishers, was known to Mr. Marcus because he had paid attention. He wanted input from the CCBC, and that's how I became acquainted with him. But that isn't why he was invited to speak here tonight. He was invited because he is the preeminent voice of the children's book world, past and present. He will talk with us this evening about a topic upon which it's essential to reflect in this digital age, why Picture books matter. Welcome, Leonard Marcus. Um, thank you uh, very much, Ginny, for that wonderful um, introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I, I was going to tell you how I met Jenny, but she just did. I think it was probably in 1980 that I was writing an article about small press books, children's books. And because it was such a diffuse topic, the, these publishers were spread all over the country and in Canada, sometimes publishing out of their own garage. It's very hard to find out where the good books were being done. And someone said, oh, call the C CCBC. And that's how Ginny and I got to be phone friends at the beginning. On track, find every, everything I needed to know. So I've always been grateful to her for that, and as well as for many other things. And also, um, it put me in mind of the unusual things that the CCBC was doing, collecting small press books, among others. Um, and I want to th uh, thank um, KT for inviting me to be here, and well, for um, to thank all of you for coming. 
I feel very honored to be here uh, today, and especially to be giving a talk named for Charlotte Zolotow, who I first met in June of 1984 on a visit to Harper's offices to comb through the Margaret Weiss Brown editorial correspondence on file there. Charlotte by then had stepped back from the editorship of the department and was overseeing the publication of a select list of books under the banner of her own Harper imprint. As busy as she was, she invited me into her office and told me a number of stories about Brown, Ursula Nordstrom, and her own first years at Harper as Nordstrom's assistant. I'm sure she was also sizing up the quiet young man who had come to rifle through the company files. But I would not have expected anything less of someone who had done so much to shape that great department. Harper was not only proud of its illustrious history, but also deeply protective of it. I could hardly believe my luck in having made it past the receptionist. Charlotte told me that afternoon that in the early 1940s, as a fairly recent University of Wisconsin graduate with dreams of a writing career, she had taken an entry-level job in publishing, and that from the first, she had wanted to make a good impression on her boss. With this in mind, she had walked into Ursula Nordstrom's office one day with a memo. The memo, she explained to Nordstrom, was the outline of a brilliant idea a brilliant idea for a picture book that Charlotte felt was just right for the list star picture book author of the early 1940s, Margaret Wise Brown. Nordstrom read the memo, but did not respond as hoped. Instead, she posed a series of questions about the synopsis that Charlotte had so thoughtfully provided. She asked for more detail in some spots, more clarity in others. She told Charlotte to go back to her typewriter and return after lunch with a better draft. Charlotte did so, addressing each of the editor's concerns in turn. Later that day, on reading the new version, Nordstrom looked up from her desk, cracked a grin, and announced in that dry, indrawn voice of hers, you have just written and I have just accepted your first picture book manuscript. <laughs> Don't ever again Tell me what someone else needs to write. Tell me what you need to write. Charlotte's memo saw the light of day as the Park Book, published by Harper in 1944 with illustrations by H.A. Ray. One reason that so many of the picture books that emanated from Ursula Nordstrom's department have continued to matter to readers for so many years, books like Goodnight Moon, Harold and the Purple Crayon, Where the Wild Things Are, and Charlotte's own Storm Book, the Quarreling Book, William's Doll, dozens of others, is that they were all expressions, to begin with, of some inner necessity of the author and illustrator. Nordstrom often said that the best books, the truly satisfying ones, were those that had been written and illustrated from the inside out. As the publishing world turned corporate, Ursula Nordstrom in 1973 took early retirement. Since that time, the market-driven market publishing that she thought so wrong-headed has increasingly become the industry norm. Not all picture books matter equally, it is fair to say. If you were looking for touchstones for the genre, books that illustrate what the picture book as an art form is capable of doing, those early Harper lists, which Charlotte Zalato, Susan Hirschman, Phyllis Vogelman, and others helped Ursula Nordstrom to build, would be a fine place to start. Apparently, I've always read below my age level. <laughs> I first read Goodnight Moon, for example, around 1979, when I was in my late 20s. <laughs> While browsing in the Marlboro Bookshop in New York's Greenwich Village, a stack of dust-jacketed hardcover copies of the book, which I had not heard of before, had been set out on a display table in the front of the store. The cover image caught my eye for its idiosyncratic mix of old-fashioned folksiness and modernist verve. The display type, trim size, color palette felt all of a piece to me. With that promising introduction, I opened the slender little volume and began to read. At the time, the name Margaret Weiss Brown was unknown to me as well. Perhaps I should explain. 
1974, after completing my formal education, I moved to New York with the goal of becoming a writer. I arrived with an undergraduate degree in history from Yale, as well as an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Graduate Writers Workshop. I came with a purist determination not to take the academic route to publication, but rather to go it alone and simply do the only thing that I thought people who wanted to write should do, write. I found a tiny apartment in the village, took an entry-level publishing job to pay the rent, and hauled out my typewriter. How romantic. As a matter of fact, I was planning to be a poet. I had developed an interest in children's books while at Yale, but only, I thought then, for purposes of an honors paper I needed to write in order to graduate. In a freshman anthropology course, I had been fascinated to realize that childhood was as much a cultural construct as it was a stage in the natural life cycle. Three years later, I produced a senior thesis on early American children's books that ex explored what I had found to be the astonishingly wide range of ideas about childhood that informed and shaped the books for young people published in the New American Republic during the decades immediately following the American Revolution. When I was just testing out this idea and went to the library in search of material, I had no idea what, if any, old books I might find. As it happened, the rare book library at Yale had a substantial collection of early 19th century American juveniles, the more surprising for the fact that Yale offered no courses in children's literature and had never done so as far as I could determine. Securing a faculty advisor for my project proved to be even harder. The first two history professors I approached turned me down on the grounds that there wasn't much to be said on the subject. But a third professor said yes. My undergraduate interest had mainly to do with the cultural messages in a bottle that are passed down by one each generation to the next generation via children's books. I was not looking at the books as literature and art. In any case, the picture book as a genre and art form hardly existed in the early 1800s. While in Iowa City, however, by which time I thought I had put my interest in children's literature behind me, I was browsing in a bookshop one day when I noticed a picture on the shelf, soon found myself absorbed by, the, by its illustrations. The book was Nancy Burkhart's Snow White, published in 1972 by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. It struck me as exquisitely beautiful, and I wondered why illustration art as compelling as Burkhardt's was not shown in art museums. Without realizing it, I think I became a picture book person that day. Flashing forward a few years, back to the Marlboro Bookshop, there I was, quietly reading Goodnight Moon, when I noticed that Brown's words were sending the chill up my spine that Emily Dickinson had said was the mark of real poetry. I had come especially to admire poetry that achieved a kind of irreducible clarity, words that seemed to get to the bottom of language. The poetry of Emily Dickinson, Elizabeth Bishop, W.S. Merwin, and Mark Strand, and the transparent prose of writers like E.B. White. Now here was Goodnight Moon, another magic string of words that, in a way, did the others one better. Poem so unadorned and so basic that a one or two year old could be touched by it, as well as um, someone like myself. What a spectacular achievement, I thought, as I turned to the back flap to read what little it had to say about the author. I did so, oddly enough, with a slight feeling of residual guilt. As an undergraduate, I had been taught not to care about the lives of the poets and writers I read. I had arrived at Yale at the tail end of the new criticism, a movement in literary theory that regarded a literary work as a self-sufficient monolith, requiring no external information, let alone tidbits of the author's backstory, to be understood and appreciated. In one sense, this approach felt liberating to me, inasmuch as it implied that even as a freshman, I already had within myself everything I needed to unravel the mysteries of the wasteland, say, or paradise lost. I could just dive right in, and I found the experience of doing so thrilling. I accepted at first the new critic's sweeping judgment that literary biography was an irrelevant, even misguided strategy for getting at the heart of literature. But my senior project had shown me that a book could have more than one story to tell, 
and that sometimes, maybe not in the case of Paradise Lost, the most interesting story might concern the circumstances surrounding the book's creation. Add to that the fact that as a fourth or fifth grader, I had decided that biography was my favorite kind of book, a preference that had largely stuck, though increasingly in parallel with my interest in poetry. Well, whatever the reason, I seemed to crave true stories about real people who had made things happen in the world. After reading Goodnight Moon, I found myself deeply curious about the author um, of such a deceptively simple lyric. As I was looking for a project, it occurred to me that perhaps I would want to write a biography of this remarkable picture book poet. It took me 10 years, but that is what I did. During all those years, I had ample time to reflect on why Margaret Weiss Brown's picture books, there were scores of them, it turned out, and especially her best known work, Goodnight Moon, mattered, both to her and to everyone else. I was fascinated to learn as well that Brown's book had not mattered at all to some very influential readers when it was first published by Harper and Brothers in 1947. Who knew that a quaint looking read aloud about bunnies at bedtime was capable of provoking controversy and arousing passionate debate? But even Harper's own sales manager had been unsure what to make of it, I discovered, and advised his sales reps not to show Goodnight Moon to store buyers, lest they conclude that a picture book with a text of just 300 words and essentially one illustration, repeated from different distances and angles, was not worth the money. The sales manager's concerns paled besides those of the New York Public Library's in-house reviewer, who bluntly dismissed Goodnight Moon as a slight and sentimental affair the nation's most influential library would not purchase copies of the book until the 1970s. How could any of this have happened? Brown, I learned, had been a struggling short story writer in Greenwich Village in the mid-1930s when a friend introduced her to the Bank Street College of Education, located just a few blocks from her apartment. Having failed to publish her stories in The New Yorker or anywhere else, she had enrolled in Bank Street School for Teachers in hopes of making something useful of her life. The progressive Bank Street program emphasized learning by doing, observing children at different stages of development, talking with them, recording their conversations, playing with them, and even writing stories for them in order to find out what types of stories they responded most strongly to as they grew and changed. It was thanks to the latter requirement that Brown discovered her talent for picture book writing. And that, with considerable help and encouragement from Bank Street founder Lucy Sprague Mitchell, she went on to hone her craft and embrace her vocation. As a picture book author, Brown artfully put into practice Mitchell's observations about the kinds of stories she had found to be most meaningful to the very young. Chief among them, the notion that up until the age of seven, children lived in a here and now world of sensory experience and of ins insatiable curiosity about the things of their everyday world. It is not hard to see how a book that zoomed in close on the familiar objects arrayed in a young child's bedroom might be thought to have advanced Mitchell's project. At first glance, Goodnight Moon would appear to be the quintessential here and now picture book. This might have been an unalloyed triumph for any writer, but for the fact that other children's literature experts of the time were sure that Mitchell's ideas were dead wrong, and that what young children really wanted and needed from their first books were once upon a time tales, whether classic fairy tales or modern make-believe, to lift them out of the mundane world into the so-called timeless realm of the imagination. The librarians who held this view regarded Mitchell as an arrogant upstart and a pseudoscientist when she claimed that her ideas about picture books had been confirmed by empirical research, as if literature could ever be conjured up in a laboratory. Brown's allegiance to Bank Street and to Mitchell herself had gone a long way toward dooming Goodnight Moon with the gatekeepers of the New York Public Library, among others. It was not until 1953 when doctors Francis Ilg and Louise Bates Ames of the Progressive Gazelle Institute of Child Development in New Haven 
recommended Goodnight Moon to parents in their nationally syndicated column, that sales of the book began to take off. As the retired publisher of Green Willow Books, Susan Hirschman has observed, had Goodnight Moon been published in today's highly commercialized publishing environment, it might very well have faded into oblivion. The, fir the very fate, I might add parenthetically, that the illustrator Clement Hurd's banker father had predicted for his son if he chose to pursue his dream of becoming an artist. It makes perfect sense to see Goodnight Moon as the most fully realized expression of Bank Street's reconsideration of the picture book for the youngest ages. But if we look closer still at the Great Green Room, the story of its, the story, of its story takes yet another unexpected turn. It is true that the Great Green Room is a well-ordered repository of the comfortingly familiar clocks and socks, comb and a brush, and a bowl of, well, you know what, I'm sure. <laughs> Brown chose, however, not to limit the, the room entirely to these mundane furnishings. By making a place for the three little bears and the cow jumping over the moon, she challenged and expanded Mitchell's initial idea by implying that the fantastic was as necessary a part of the child's everyday existence as was food, clothing, and shelter. Viewed this way, Goodnight Moon turns out to be the picture book that more than any other one reconciled the progressive educator's here and now vision for preschool literature with the librarian's once upon a time ideal. It is as though Brown had realized that her mentor, Lucy Mitchell, and the librarians who opposed her each had gotten only half the story right. For Brown herself, peacemaking lay at the core of what Goodnight Moon was all about. She had scribbled the text in nearly finished form in a burst of creativity on awakening one morning after a dream in the early months of 1945 as the United States remained at war around the world. Several of her artist and writer friends were away at war, including Clement Hurd, with whom she had last collaborated on The Runaway Bunny just prior to his departure for the Pacific. Within days of Hurd's return to New York, Brown sent him the manuscript of Goodnight Moon as a welcome home gift, meant to help him jumpstart his stalled career. Throughout the war, green inks and dyes had been pulled from the home front market for use by the military, including by Hurd himself, who had been assigned, as so many artists were, to a camouflage unit. In 1947, a picture book featuring a great green room would have seen would have been seen by many as a declaration that peace had indeed been restored. It so happens that Brown's own childhood bedroom, which she shared with her precocious younger sister, Roberta, had, been, had, had pale green walls and a fire grate decorated with ceramic tiles depicting the cow jumping over the moon and other Mother Goose characters. There, however, any similarity between the hushed and calming atmosphere in Goodnight Moon and the emotional broken and chilly brown household of Whitestone, New York, circa 1915, comes to an end. As the second of three children of bitterly unhappy parents whose marriage ended in divorce, Brown had nothing like the peaceful childhood she might have wished for. A supervisor, reporting on her student teaching work while at Bank Street would note Brown's, quote, strong sense of justice. It is as if she remembered her own childhood and wanted to make good to the spirit of childhood for the grown-ups who had not understood her. Behind a closing line as simple sounding as goodnight noises everywhere lay a lifetime of tumultuous memories. A two-year-old being lulled to bed night after night by goodnight moon need not know any of this any more than you or I to live in a house need to know how to build one. Knowing the background of the book, however, um, it does give those of us who ask why picture books matter a clearer understanding of the emotional cost at which a book's seeming simplicity is sometimes achieved. The unsimple thoughts, feelings, and experiences that Brown had lived through and that as a writer, she so powerfully distilled. Children of the youngest ages find their own sense of peace in the book's musicality, its lilting rhythms and cadences, rhyme, sorry, rhymes and cadences. As Brown once jauntily remarked, 
a good picture book text can almost be whistled. This was the writer who, having read a story in French to a group of young children who did not know the language, concluded from the experiment, they did not understand a word, they loved every syllable. I could recite a list longer than Brown's own text of other reasons that Goodnight Moon has mattered to children, but will instead point to just one more reason, and that is Goodnight Moon's effectiveness as an interactive book. I am not referring here to the pop-up edition, <laughs> which came and went some years ago. Ordinarily, interactive books are thought to be those that come equipped with novelty add-ons of one kind or another, full tabs, textured surfaces, liftable flaps, buttons that trigger sound chips, and the like. These mechanical devices do provide for a certain kind of interactivity, but not the kind I mean here. I am thinking, rather, of a special level of engagement that Brown's words are able to establish with a young listener or reader. An article of faith of progressive education in nearly all its forms has been the conviction that children learn best when they become full collaborators in learning. Brown's books are salted with opportunities and invitations for children to add their own words to the authors, thereby turning them into fellow rhymers and storytellers. As brief as the text of Goodnight Moon is, it divides naturally into two parts. Part one is a kind of creation story, an enumeration of the contents of the great green room in the calm and un unwavering voice of a parent or God. This room is your world, the good provider says. You may rest easy here. Then, without fanfare, the text shifts, and in part two, as one good night is said after another, a child without prompting will very often chime in by the end perhaps even saying good night to favorite objects not in the great green room, but rather in their own room. Throughout the body of her work, Brown used rhyme, call and response, dialogue, game-like questions and simple word patterns like good night this and good night that to give young children basic, easy to grasp structures within which to frame their own thoughts, feelings and perceptions. Can you remember as a preschooler wanting to ask a question but not knowing quite how to go about lining up the words in just the right way, I can remember having that exact struggle vividly. Years later, when I was a day camp counselor for six-year-olds, the most verbal boy in the group would come up to me every now and then, blurt out a line or two, and ask, is that a joke? <laughs> he too was struggling to find a form for his thoughts. The picture books that matter to children, Brown believed, are the ones that are never really finished. When visual artists such as Leo Leone, Ezra Jack Keats, Eric Carle, and Lois Ehlert have made picture books in an art medium, collage, that their preschooler readers are already aware of, they are incidentally offering children handy models and patterns with which to have their own pictorial say. I turned three in the year that Ilgen Ames first touted Goodnight Moon's, uh, Margaret Weiss Brown's masterpiece. My mother must not have been a fan. Looking back, I see that the picture books that mattered to me as a child were a motley assortment. I don't think I knew even one Caldecott Medal winner. Ludwig Bemelmans received the Caldecott Medal for um, Madeline's Rescue in 1954, the year I turned four. Four years later, Robert McCloskey won, the, won for Time of Wonder. Robert who? My parents were not book people and neither apparently were any of my first teachers. Nearly all my first picture books were little golden books that my mother must have purchased at our local five and dime or at the supermarket in suburban Mount Vernon, New York. I kept the books lined up side by side so that the gold tinsel spines formed a kind of gold brick on my shelf. As a preschooler, I was not sure that they were not real gold, and I know that I hoped they were. I recall not so much loving those books as latching on to them for answers to questions, pressing questions I had, or to satisfy some other specific need. 
My grown relatives, for example, were always asking what I wanted to be when I grew up. And here was a book called When I Grow Up, which laid out what I took to be the available options. <laughs> At age three or four, I found myself straddling the fence between cowboy and gas station attendant. <laughs> it was a hard choice laced with imponderables. But contemplating such questions seemed then to be the work of childhood. Another golden book that mattered to me was an obscure title from 1952 called Laddie and the Little Rabbit by William Gottlieb. It was an unusual picture book for having been photographically illustrated. The story itself was a rather conventional one about a brother and sister and their two house pets, a Springer Spaniel and a rabbit. Golden Books had made an art of publishing books on topics of likely interest to large numbers of children. And in those days, I wanted a dog desperately. But my mother, reasonably citing my history of allergies, would not allow my sister and me to have a dog or a rabbit. And I seemed to have decided that having that book was the next best thing. I could, for one thing, stare at the pictures, imagining that those other children's pets were mine. At night, I went further, dreaming my way into the pictures of the book. That is to say, like the projectionist played by Buster Keaton in the silent co uh, comedy film classic Sherlock Jr., I had dreams in which I would get inside the photographer's pictures, and I suppose having shoved the other boy to one side <laughs> would take my rightful place in that better world. Decades later, when I was writing my history of golden books, Golden Legacy, I was disappointed not to find more, much information about the author photographer Gottlieb. At the end of a pre-publication program for librarians at which I mentioned this regret, a member of the audience came forward and announced that Bill Gottlieb's widow was her own best friend. A meeting was arranged and before long Delia Gottlieb and I had become friends too. From Delia, I learned that picture bookmaking had been just a sideline for her husband, who worked for decades as a jazz critic and photographer. Some of the best known photos of Billie Holiday and Duke Ellington are his. So that was why his name never turned up in the usual child lit resource, reference resources. I also learned that the dog I had so coveted years earlier had been Delia's dog, and that the dog's real name was not Laddie, but James Thurber. Ah, uh, research. <laughs> what were the chances of ferreting out that fact? <laughs> I'm struck now by the powerful impact both these far from metal-worthy picture books had on me as an intensely curious, often bewildered, and always impressionable preschooler. Evidently, picture books can matter to children for all sorts of reasons, not all of them immediately discernible, to those of us who make it our business to recognize the good and the great ones. Here is one more example of an unremarkable yet memorable picture book, this one not from my golden book shelf. Among the hand-me-down books that I as the youngest of three children had at home was an abridgment of John Ruskin's Victorian fairy tale, The King of the Golden River. I love the story in which the southwest wind intervenes in the fate of the story's central characters, three brothers, two of them evil, the youngest of whom is good. For years after I first read the book, I would think back to it, recalling one illustration in particular, a drawing in which the southwest wind was personified as a mighty, puffy-cheeked baby. As the youngest child, it continued to thrill me um, on into my teens and beyond to think that a baby could wield such uh, decisive power. Still later, years after I had begun writing professionally about children's book history, my mother said one day that she had come across an old childhood book of mine and did I want it. It was, of course, that favorite book. I grabbed hold of it and rapidly thumbed through the pages in search of the illustration I so fondly remembered. To my great surprise, I found that there was no such picture. I had dreamt that, had I dreamt that image too? Apparently I had. Bruno Bettelheim wrote about this phenomenon in The Uses of Enchantment, when he observed that young children will often alter a fairy tale in memory or in the retelling <clears throat> to suit their own deep-seated psychic needs. 
All those years later, I had remembered a book illustration that did not exist except in my memory because I had once needed it so badly. If I had a motto, it would read, in Latin of course, Every, everything happens all at once. My son, Jacob Henry Marcus, was born on April Fool's Day, 1992, in the same week that my biography of Margaret Weiss Brown was published. I had, as I have already mentioned, I had, as I have already mentioned, spent 10 years writing that book. So it is not surprising that among my first thoughts as a new father was, at last, someone to read Goodnight Moon to, myself. <laughs> As it turned out, Jacob would have nothing to do with Brown's most celebrated creation. <laughs> it made him yawn. Not an altogether inappropriate response, you will agree. But he clearly did not take to the book in the way so many thousands and millions of other small children have done and do, making a bedtime ritual of the nightly readings, a ritual that in some households I've heard about entails a prescribed number of multiple nightly readings, the record I am aware of being six. As Parenting Magazine's book reviewer, I was receiving daily shipments of box loads of new children's books and would often read one or two of the latest arrivals to my son, more or less at random. Having been surprised by Jacob's response to Goodnight Moon, I was surprised again by the enthusiasm with, he, with which he took to a mass market lift the flap book that had come in the mail called Where's My Squishy Ball? <laughs> Ever heard of it? <laughs> I was about 12 years into my career as a high-minded reviewer and, and thought I knew a good picture book when I saw one. Now, however, the experience of, a, of being a parent taught me a different lesson that no book, however aesthetically satisfying or developmentally sound, was necessarily the right book for every child of a given age. Maurice Sendak said as much when he remarked that he would rather see a child hurl a copy of Goodnight Moon across the room than be forced to read it or hear it read. Sometimes it is best simply to take the child's lead. I think I realized then that the best lesson that any child can learn from their first books is that reading is enjoyable and as such, worth doing. Something else that I learned from reading to Jacob when he was very young was that I was possessed of a strong, seemingly built-in urge to get to the end of a book. Once I had started reading a book aloud, I wanted with a level of determination that surprised me to complete the task. I was goal-oriented. I imagine that many adults feel the same way. But at two or three, Jacob had not near, was not nearly so single-mindedly goal-oriented as his dad, at least not with regard to the same goals. He wanted to roam around inside a picture that caught his fancy in much the same way that he explored a room or a yard or a playground. This meant I realized that I would have to slow down and that I would have to give up much of my control over the experience of reading the book. In the beginning, this took a considerable act of will, especially the part about learning to care less about crossing the finish line. Once I made the adjustment, however, I began to enjoy what I came to call off-road reading. <laughs> In some instances, ignoring the text of a book altogether in favor of having a conversation in which we both regarded the illustrations as clues to what might be happening to the hero, Curious George or Corduroy or whoever. It was a challenging, at times even taxing way to read a picture book, taxing for the same reason that not every adult feels up to sharing with a child wordless picture books like those by the extraordinary Japanese artist Mitsumasa Anno for example. But in time, going off-road came to feel like an adventure with its own rewards, one that allowed us each to make up bits and pieces of a story, even as we felt ourselves to be reading the book open before us. Robert Lawson could have had my own son in mind when he said in his 1941 Caldecott Medal acceptance speech, for they were strong and good, 
No one can possibly tell what tiny detail of a drawing or what seemingly trivial phrase in a story will be the spark that sets off a great flash in the mind of some child, a flash that will leave a glow there till the day he dies. Lawson's suggestion that any picture book has the potential to, to touch a child's life and to do so when we least expect it is certainly borne out but by my own rather checkered first experiences with books, as well as by my sons. Implicit in Lawson's remark is the corollary that children best, are best served when they have access to the widest possible variety of books. I might not have thought to give Jacob the Berenstain Bears books till I noticed at our local library one day how very drawn he was to them. Once again, I had to rethink my standards and to realize there was a place, a really big place to judge by their undeniable um, popularity for books that looked at everyday situations in a comfortingly matter of fact and highly structured way and that featured illustrations which, though never even remotely likely to win a medal, had the merit of being cheerily accessible and wholly non-threatening. What, though, of the picture books that we, that we say deserve our prizes and that sometimes win them? The books which, when viewed by you or me, with our critics' glasses on tight, strike us as pinnacles of an art form, brilliant confirmation that the first books we as a culture give our children have the potential to transcend the merely cute, well-meaning, and trivial, and to provide a memorable interlude of one kind or another, what the poet Wallace Stevens called unprecedented experience that only a true work of art can offer. Hearing that a given child did not love Goodnight Moon, or that Marie Sendak occasionally came across one who loathed where the wild things are, may serve as a healthy corrective to the confidence we place in our own critical judgment, but it does not lessen the value of thinking about what picture books work best on their own aesthetic terms, and in terms of what we know about childhood and the culture of childhood. As an artist and spokesperson who advocated for the field, Marie Sendak did more than anyone to move the picture book a giant step closer to the center of the cultural mainstream and to popularize the idea, first expressed by the pioneering children's librarians of the early decades of the last century, that picture books are our first gateways to a lifelong appreciation of literature and art he did so at a time when, as I mentioned earlier, the movement to commercialize publishing for children and teens was already strong and steadily gaining momentum. The combination we have seen of rapid consolidation on the part both of publishers and booksellers has been a bad cocktail that has, on the whole, favored the safely predictable and tried and true over the innovative and idiosyncratic. What Ursula Nordstrom in retirement sardonically referred to as marginal books, like the ones that she had made a career of championing, championing, championing. Nonetheless, and thanks no, in no small part to the paradigm altering career of Marie Sendak, the bigger picture for the picture book today seems far from bleak. More art schools now than in generations past offer courses in children's book illustration more art students than ever think of, the picture, as, of picture book making as a cool and worthy vocation. More established artists, especially graphic artists and editorial illustrators who staple magazine and newspaper work evaporated along with much of print journalism, have turned to the picture book as an attractive outlet for their talent. As color printing technology has advanced, the creative options available to the most inventive and discerning artists have increased as well. A growing number of art museums, eager to connect with younger audiences, including families, have become open for the first time to exhibiting picture book art. Our country now also has three museums devoted entirely to children's book art. And, this, and similar museums are to be found in England, Japan, Korea, and elsewhere. Present day interest in the picture book is truly international in scope. In French West Africa, 
one of the poorest regions in the world. Efforts have been underway since the 1970s to publish picture books for the very young, illustrated books that teach rudimentary lessons as critical in a newly developing economy as crosswalk safety for young pedestrians to whom cars and trucks are new things under the sun, and picture books that help to build a sense of national identity by retelling traditional folk tales and the life stories of national heroes. Halfway around the world in China, the Feng Zikai Award for Picture Book Art was established just a few years ago to encourage the creation of Western style picture books for young Chinese readers. I was as puzzled as I was thrilled to learn several months ago that my book, Dear Genius, The Letters of Ursula Nordstrom, would soon be published in China. As I came to know more about what was happening there, however, it became clear that Nordstrom had been identified as a master at publishing children's books that last, and that the Chinese had opted to learn from the master. The far-flung examples of French West Africa and China indicate a broadly based appreciation of the picture book as a highly effective medium for communicating with the young. Nonetheless, here in this country, and for all sorts of reasons, there seem to be two current arguments aimed at highlighting the limits of the genre's value. The belief that picture books are a kind of water wings literature that ought to be shed in favor of real reading at the earliest possible moment, and the belief that digital technology in, is far fast rendering the traditional printed picture book obsolete. I would like to offer a few thoughts in response to each of these arguments both of which strike me as questionable. With regard to the first, one reason that picture books ought not to be hurried past is that they tell a story in two richly expressive languages, neither of which we ever really outgrow, the language of pictures and the language of words. The two story strands of a picture book can never be completely reconciled, and in the best such books, starting with the pathfinding comic page turners created by Randolph Caldecott toward the end of the 19th century, they ricochet and play off one another in all sorts of evocative and unpredictable ways, compelling readers to draw them together interpretive, interpretively any which way they can. A brain specialist would be able to tell you exactly which portions of the brain are being stimulated when this happens. But my friends in, in that field assure me that it is a well-established fact that the area of the brain that makes sense of visual imagery is not the same one that processes language. And that from a purely developmental standpoint, picture books are thus a kind of twofer of mental nourishment and stimulation. The common notion that children want and need pictures only in their first years and that they soon outgrow illustrated books is a culturally arbitrary notion, one that the astonishing rise of the graphic novel may do a lot to upend. Ambitious parents who take a lingering attachment to picture books as an ill omen for future admission to Harvard <laughs> may be misreading the situation. In the process of pushing their six or seven-year-olds prematurely into chapter books or Harry Potter, they can run the risk of branding all books in the child's mind as required reading, rather than as something to be enjoyed, and may as a result actually hurt, not help, the child's long-term prospects. In an undergraduate level course I taught for several years on children's book history, I had an art student come up to me one day after class with a worried, embarrassed look on her face. The student explained that she had a younger sister who at 12 was still interested in picture books. Did I think there might be something wrong with her? I replied that while I could not be sure about someone I had never met, I doubted, I doubted it and thought there could be all sorts of reasons for her sister's continued interest in illustrated books, including the possibility that she had dreams of becoming an illustrator. Even for children with no particular talent for or interest in art, picture books have an essential role to play in fostering what has come to be called visual literacy. In a world where everyone is exposed to advertising images at nearly every turn, 
it seems critical for children to learn from an early age not to believe or be seduced by everything they see and to feel at home interpreting and questioning visual information. Surprisingly, few of us grow up secure in that skill. Go to any art museum and watch how people look at the art. Nine out of 10 will head straight for the wall label or reach for the audio guide for a verbal explanation of the thing they had come to see. My guess is that one reason that parents want their children to be done with picture books as soon as possible has something to do with their own deep-seated discomfort with visual art. One last thought about this. Perhaps the most common reason that picture books are dismissed when they are dismissed as being of no particular consequence is on the grounds of their supposed artlessness and simplicity, as in, I could have done that. Margaret Weiss Brown's brother-in-law, an economic historian, thought it laughable that Brown had chosen to spend her days composing stories and rhymes of a very few words for people not yet old enough to read them. He clung to this belief until one day he estimated the number of words Brown wrote in a typical, in a typical year and divided that number into the impressively large number that represented her average annual income. Of course, the only thing that is really simple about picture book making is how to make a bad one. I had an accountant who proved this to me one day. <laughs> and also a dentist. <laughs> the picture books we are most apt to remember are not simple so much as they are distilled. As such, they are epitomes of the clear, the immediate, the finely crafted, and the dramatically expressive in communication. Viewed this way, at what, at one point in li at what point in life can anyone be said to have outgrown picture books? As for the argument that printed picture books are outmoded now that digital books have arrived, my thought would be, well, yes and no, but mostly no. While most everyone would agree that we are living through a, tr a transitional time in the history of the book, it seems clear to me, to paraphrase Mark Twain, that the dire predictions we've all heard of the picture book's demise have been greatly exaggerated. I don't see the printed picture book disappearing anytime soon, only becoming a bit more specialized. If anything, picture books are likely to be the last of all traditional books left standing. Though I'm not persuaded we are anywhere near that point either. Why do I say this? Why do I think that printed picture books still matter? For one thing, the physical attributes of the picture book as we have come to know it work so well from the child's point of view. At a time in their lives when children derive much of their information about the world from sensory experience, from touching, smelling, tasting, as well as looking and hearing, the act of holding a book in hand and gently but firmly clasping and turning its pages while also perhaps being held securely within a loving caregiver's arms is an essential, not peripheral, part of their first experiences of books. For the child not yet able to read, it may in fact be one of the most satisfying parts. Margaret Weiss Brown said that each page, each turn sorry, each page turn in a picture book ought to create the same sense of anticipation and surprise as that of a theater curtain raised. A child able independently to turn the pages of a book without accidentally tearing them and at a particular pace can take pride in the accomplishment while also feeling in charge of the show. Do such children also experience pleasure from the texture and feel of, the fir of their first book's pages? The perennial appeal of Pat the Bunny suggests that many may well do so. Maurice Sendak's first childhood memory of a book was not of the story or the illustrations, but of the smell of the binding. What psychologists call the child's fine motor skills are also exercised each time he or she swipes the screen of an electronic device, of course, although perhaps not quite such fine or nuanced ones. But if paper and digital picture books are to be evaluated comparatively, 
A more fundamental contrast lies in the extent to which the two formats allow for expressive variation in their look and design. In the New York Public Library exhibition that I curated called the ABC of it, a section titled The Size and Shape of Things takes up this question, considering the picture book as a material object. A few key historical examples make the point that as illustrators and designers continued to explore the picture book's expressive potential, new ways were found to turn a given book's physical makeup, its trim size, for example, to dramatic advantage. Thus, the story of Babar in its original oversized French and American editions was a volume of suitably elephantine proportions. While Margaret Weiss Brown and Garth Williams' Little Fur Family appeared in 1946 as a wee, slip-cased book in the little books for little hands tradition that Beatrix Potter first championed with the tale of Peter Rabbit. Brown and Williams' book was notable, too, for having been jacketed in real rabbit's fur. An unimaginable choice in terms of our contemporary sensitivities <laughs> and standards, and even in the 1940s, a highly, highly idiosyncratic arrangement, to say the least. Brown, however, had been adamant in her discussions with Ursula Nordstrom that animistic, touchy-feely two-, three-, and four-year-olds would love a book that was halfway to looking and feeling like the little fur child in her story. Months later, a fan letter sent to Harper's offices seemed to bear the author out when the mother in question reported that her small son had held an open copy of Little Fur Family at the dinner table one evening, held it open, and tried to feed the book his supper. <laughs> Also on view in the Size and Shape of Things case is Peter Newell's The Slant Book, a nifty novelty volume from the turn of the last century, designed not in the standard format of a rectangle or square, but rather as a rhombus that at first glance looks to be not a real book at all, but a weird funhouse mirror distortion of one. Beyond the novelty factor, the striking slant-wise design sets the stage for a slapstick farce featuring a runaway baby carriage rolling helter-skelter down a hill. Form following function, as Frank Lloyd Wright's mentor, architect Louis Sullivan, had famously said it should do only a few years earlier. The final book in the grouping is André Francois's elegant deadpan crocodile tears, shown in its elaborate original slipcase, meant to suggest a shipping crate suitable for a long, narrow build reptilian. In these and other picture books, size and shape become insepar as inseparable from the storyline as the rhyme scheme is from the content of a sonnet. A screen of fixed dimensions lacks the flexibility to accommodate anything like these playful variations. Those who say that digital and print versions of a picture book are fundamentally the same because page for page the text and illustrations are identical are starting from too narrow a, defi a definition of content and of the picture book. The major advantage that digital books have over traditional print is, of course, the option of animation. Exciting work is bound to be done that takes full advantage of this opportunity. The picture book as an art form came into its own in the late 19th century in parallel with the invention of the motion picture. And in the hands of the amazing Randolph Caldecott, picture book making was, in a very real sense, an effort in that same direction. Caldecott was impelled to invent a new kind of illustrated children's book by the urge to capture in drawing the propulsive energy and accelerated pace of life of the steam-driven industrial age world in which he and the children for whom he created his books were living. He found an ingenious means to that end as he turned toward minimalism in drawing. What Caldecott realized was that by showing less of a subject on the page, he could compel the viewer to imagine more of it. This was Caldecott's idea of interactivity, and it has reverberated down through the years in the picture book art of Robert McCloskey, Murray Sendak, the Provinsons, David Wiesner, and many others. Caldecott's ground-shaking books 
raise the question of whether animation is always preferable to stillness in narrative art. Do we really need, in every instance, to see the dog's tail wag? Picture book illustrators from Caldecott onward have prided themselves on their ability to take drawing to the very edge of motion. Sendak called this the quickening effect that gave the wild rumpus its wildness. More recently, the French picture book artist Hervé Toulet has shown with his sly spoof of screen-centered technology, press here, that children can and do still respond well to a book that calls on them with no batteries required to make things happen in their mind's eye. As publishers seek to identify the audience for digital picture books and to establish their utility, by which I mean show the world what digital picture books can do better than print ones, publishers are also taking a second, more searching look at paper. At a recent program I hosted with art directors from three major publishing companies, each panelist noted a new receptivity within their house to stretching their production budgets a bit for the sake of making the traditional picture books on their list more special as physical objects. On recent browsing excursions in bookstores, I have noticed a similar trend taking hold in other, less expected publishing categories as well. The return, for instance, to only a very limited extent for now, of the illustrated novel for adult readers and the advent of the exquisitely designed and produced small book showcasing a famous writer's essay or novella. I was surprised a year or so ago to learn that large numbers of teen girls had wanted cloth-bound copies of the Twilight series. The reading of these books having been a benchmark experience in their lives, they had apparently felt the need to archive the experience in something like permanent form. No one should underestimate the thinginess of books. Books are not just metaphorical doors, but also real ones that we like to open for ourselves. As publishers struggle to find a good and sensible balance between digital and print, the picture book and its natural ally, the artist book, looks increasingly to be the laboratory in which the future of the printed book as a whole will be decided. In poorer parts of the world, where people have cell phones and not much else, many children will probably experience their first books on small screens, if they experience books at all. Having a book on a phone screen is certainly a lot better than not having any. But when I think about what part of the experience of the picture book might most readily get lost that way, one of the first books that comes to mind is Vera B. Williams' More, 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 Said the Baby, in which, um, in painting the illustrations, Williams applied the paint so thickly and in such a voluptuous and gestural manner that you cannot help but feel her presence as you look at them, the human touch of the artist. This intimate connection, which in the case of Williams' book, happens to mirror precisely the tender responses of the characters uh, to each other, is one of the greatest rewards that any picture book can offer its readers, adult or child. In the same spirit, Margaret Weiss Brown compared the cadence of the picture book text we remember to the rhythm of the heartbeat that a child feels when held close, and to the rhythm of being rocked to sleep at night. Writing in 1952, when some of the first televisions were coming into American homes, Brown observed, quote, in this modern world where activity is stressed almost to the point of mania, quietness as a childhood need is too often overlooked. Yet a child's need for quietness is the same today as it has always been. It may be even greater, for quietness is an essential part of all awareness. In quiet times and sleepy times, a child can dwell in thoughts of his own and in songs and stories of his own. It would seem that the picture book was made to help bring about this wished for result. Thank you.